So let's say that you've got this hematopoietic stem cell, and this guy's basically starting his choose your own adventure game. It can choose to differentiate into a myeloid stem cell or a lymphoid stem cell. Sometimes we just call these precursor cells blasts. If it goes the myeloid path, it can go on to be all sorts of specialized cells like red blood cells, monocytes, granulocytes, or megakaryocytes. Alternatively, it could choose the lymphoid stem cell route, and it can go on to become B cells or T cells of the immune system. These adventures of the hematopoietic stem cells are usually happening all the time, and new cells are like always being created. In acute leukemia though, they lose this ability to differentiate or mature into one of these cells. So for example, they might get to the myeloid blast part of the adventure, but can't differentiate any further. And when they can't go anywhere, they start to build up. So you end up with this buildup of these blasts or stem cells. And since this is all happening in your bone marrow, this buildup will also happen in your bone marrow. So if you took a sample of somebody's bone marrow that didn't have acute leukemia, you'd probably notice that the percentage of their blast cells is about 1-2%, to which would be normal. If there are greater than 20% blast cells in the bone marrow though, we define that as acute leukemia. When all these blast cells start to build up, they get crowded, and they crowd out or sort of get in the way of normal cells differentiating. So what happens is you end up presenting with a loss of cells that you'd normally produce in the bone marrow. Like if you had a loss of red blood cells, you'd develop anemia, where you might have symptoms of fatigue. Or maybe you're missing platelets, so you get thrombocytopenia and have problems with bleeding. Or neutrophils and neutropenia and start getting more infections. Usually symptoms like this can come about relatively quickly, which is why we say that it's acute leukemia. Eventually, these blasts build up to a point where they start to spill out into the bloodstream, which typically causes your white blood cell count to go up. So if you took a peek at a blood smear, there's a couple things to look for. First, look at how large these guys are compared to the normal cells. Another thing is that they'll be pretty immature, judging by this relatively low amount of cytoplasm. Alright, great, so we figured out that it's a blast cell. But what kind of blast cell is it? Lymphoid or myeloid? Hmm, tough to say. This is important though, because if they have a buildup of myeloblasts, they'll actually have acute myeloid leukemia. Whereas if they have a buildup of lymphoblast, they'll have acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And these two are very different and need very different treatments. So what we're going to do is we're going to look for certain markers. For the lymphoblast, the most important marker is that they'll have this positive nuclear staining for TDT in the cell's nucleus. TDT is a DNA polymerase that's present only in the nucleus of the lymphoblasts, not in the lymphocytes, or the mature cells, and not in the myeloblasts. So if a nuclear stain comes out positive for TDT, we know that it's got to be a lymphoblast, right? For the myeloblasts, presence of myeloperoxidase, an enzyme, indicates that we've got to have a myeloid blast on our hands. Usually this is done by cytoplasmic staining, but you can also look for this like crystallized version of the enzyme called an hour rod under the microscope. Okay, so let's say that we've got a positive test for DNA polymerase TDT, meaning that we've got a lymphoblast, so we must have acute lymphoblastic leukemia. It actually gets a little more complicated though. Remember the lineage where lymphoblasts go on to be either B or T cells? Well, in between, they become either B lymphoblasts or T lymphoblasts. So really, you can have subtype B acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or BALL, or T acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or TALL. Just like we figured out that as a lymphoblast with TDT positivity, we can also determine which subtype of lymphoblast it is based on surface markers. The most commonly seen are these B lymphoblasts, so BALL. And super important and specific surface markers to look for are C10, C19, and C20. Treatment of BALL usually involves chemotherapy, and there's usually a very good response. But one thing you have to remember is that the chemotherapy goes into the blood, and it can't cross either the blood-brain barrier or the blood-testicular barrier. So patients will often need prophylactic injection of the chemotherapy to the scrotum and the cerebrospinal fluid. If we look at these patients a little more closely, at their cytogenetic abnormalities, so like abnormalities in their chromosomes, we can get an idea of their prognosis. If they have a translocation of chromosome 12 and 21, or T1221, they'll usually have a pretty good prognosis, and this tends to happen more in children. 
A 922 translocation, or sometimes called pH positive, or the Philadelphia chromosome, on the other hand, is a pretty poor prognosis, and this one's seen more in adults. Okay, for the T lymphoblastic sort, they'll usually express surface markers that range from CD2 to CD8. Unlike BALL, these blasts do not express CD10. Okay, so luckily we've got some helpful mnemonics with TALL. It usually presents as this thymic mass in the mediastinum, so T for thymus. And this happens most often in teenagers, T for teens. So we're going to call this acute lymphoblastic lymphoma. Wait, why not leukemia? Well, remember that for leukemias, the malignant cells float around in the blood, where lymphoma means that the malignant cells are forming this mass. So in this case, it's called lymphoma since it's forming this thymic mass. Okay, so that's all for the ALL type. Let's switch gears to the AML type, which is this accumulation of myeloblasts. Remember that we're looking for an enzyme called myeloperoxidase, right? Which can present as these hour rods, like in this picture. This structure right here is an hour rod, which is basically like this crystallized aggregate of myeloperoxidase, which is only found in myeloblasts. AML, unlike ALL, is more common in adults between the ages of 50 and 60, and can actually be subclassified in three ways, either again by cytogenetic abnormalities, the lineage of the myeloblasts, or by surface markers. One important subtype of AML to be aware of is acute promyelocytic leukemia, and this is characterized by translocation of chromosomes 15 and 17. So right now we're subclassifying based on cytogenetic abnormalities, right? Chromosomes 15 and 17. This translocation ends up disrupting the retinoic acid receptor, which hurts the cell's ability to mature, and you get this buildup of promyelocytes. These cells also tend to have a lot of hour rods, which increases the chance of coagulation, which makes it a medical emergency due to the risk of disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC. One way to treat promyelocytic leukemia is with all trans retinoic acid, or ATRA which is this derivative of vitamin A. And this guy binds to the disrupted retinoic acid receptor and actually causes these blasts to mature into neutrophils, which eventually go on to die, but it does sort of lift some of the leukemic burden since there aren't as many of these blasts floating around. So that one was characterized by its cytogenetic abnormalities, right? But we can also characterize by the lineages. So sort of just like lymphoid blasts can go on to be either T or B lymphoblasts, you could have an AML like erythroblast AML, or megakaryoblasts, or monoblast AML, all which would involve this proliferation of that type of cell. So one that's important to know about is this last one, monoblast AML, or acute monocytic leukemia. So these monoblasts build up and they actually often lack myeloperoxidase. But what we can look for instead is this infiltration of the patient's gums. So check out this image. Notice how this patient's gums are clearly swollen, and this is a classic sign of acute monocytic leukemia. Another important subtype, though, is megakaryoblastic leukemia, so a buildup of megakaryoblasts. Just like the monoblasts, these don't have myeloperoxidase either, but there's this association with Down syndrome before the age of 5. So this is actually an important point. In general, patients with Down syndrome have an increased risk of acute leukemia, usually acute megakaryoblastic leukemia when it's before the age of 5, and ALL after the age of 5. Now, there are also conditions that aren't necessarily AML, but can actually lead to AML, and one is called myelodysplastic syndrome, which is characterized by this abnormal buildup of blasts in the bone marrow, which sounds familiar, right? But at this point, it's below 20%, so we don't call it AML yet. Myelodysplasia, meaning bad formation of bone marrow cells, often leads patients to have a low blood cell count since the cells aren't developing right, which is also called cytopenia. Because they have these cytopenias, they often actually die due to infection or bleeding. But they can also progress to acute leukemia if their blast percentage goes over 20%. So then they'd have something like AML with a background of myelodysplasia. And that's an overview of acute leukemia, as well as some of the more common subtypes of acute leukemia.